Hey there, and welcome to the daily podcast where wisdom smacks us with kisses or love taps. I'm Michelle Spiva, a wisdom strengthening coach, your host, and practical priestess of wisdom. Join us daily to gain wisdom and mental strength as we tackle innovative thinking, address emotional and behavioral life traps, and yes, provide you with some practical how-tos to wrap it all up. So settle in or crank up the speed 2x, whatever gets your mental processes firing as we dive in. Stay tuned. Hey there, it's Michelle Spivey, your Practical Priestess of Wisdom with today's podcast of Wisdom Smack. So just a note on the tone. It'll be a little heavier today, but it'll be pretty okay. What we're going to be talking about today is self-pity, how to recognize it and suss it out and hunt it down. And I'm talking about obliterate it and why you need to do this, because it could mean your very uh, life or death to let this go unchecked. And with the way times are at the time of this recording, I think that it is very much in keeping with the wisdom that we need to navigate our now and our next. And so join me as we get into how to hunt down and destroy self-pity. I'll see you on the flip. Hey there, thank you so much for joining me on The Flip. Let's get into it. So today, I am going to be talking to you about how to hunt and destroy self-pity. And I want to open it up with a quick little story time about that time when the love of my life and I had broken up. And it's like a year after, and I'm doing what I know to do. You know, that knowing, that uh, intellectual side as, you know, a therapist with some skills under her belt. And... One of the things that I never thought that I would have to go through was inevitable. I was in my bathroom after a shower and wiping the mirror clean and I catch a glimpse of myself. And in that split nanosecond, whatever you want to call it, I had become that person that I didn't want to be. And that had been one of the tenets in my relationship with this person at the beginning. I was like, I never want to do anything where I can't look at myself in the mirror in the morning, you know, and here I am uh, at least a year out from the relationship thinking I'm doing good and I am sucker punched and I break down and I cry and it got me to a point where I don't want anyone else to ever get to. And that was a point of extreme self-pity. And so how in hindsight, because it took a minute for me to get there and then work my way out of it. And so how I got there was I, I allowed thoughts and memories to go unchecked and not do the work to learn the lessons and move forward and do the clearing out, uh, pulling of the weeds, if you will, to make sure that they didn't overtake my garden of my heart and my hope. And I didn't do this by every time a memory jolted me where I had that visceral intake of, you know, where I'm like, oh, I can't believe I did that or I allowed that or I said that or whatever. Instead of dealing with it and like, why is this coming up now and what can I learn from it and how can I change, you know, so that I am not that person anymore, I would just push it back. I won't deal with that, you know. You know, even to the point of shaking my head, like, "Uh, we're not going to think about that. And you do that long enough. And what starts to happen is these memories start to form a club. They start start to form a guild. (laughs) And that guild is called self-pity. And what self-pity does is self-pity loves to find all of those negative, unchecked emotions and memories. And oh, and if it can find a good fertile patch of regret, oh honey, it can't, that's, 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 that's like fertilizer. It will dig its tentacles down deep and get good roots and start to drain all the nutrients of who you are 
And the thing about self-pity is that insidious bastard has the nerve to be nigh invisible to you. And that's part of self-pity. It's hard. That's why you have to hunt it down because it will be right there for everybody else to see. And you'll be on a stack of Bibles like, "Mm -mm, that's not me. Mm -mm, No, 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 no. And you'll be totally oblivious to this, this malignant tumor that's taking your vitality and your life away. So now that you have heard me, you know, share my scar and not my wound, let's talk about that. So one of the ways to start hunting down this self-pity that causes you to be woe is me is to look at any areas that when you revisit them, there's a a visceral intake. It's still tender to the gaze, not even the touch, just to the gaze. You know, it wants to uh, cower in the corners and you You'll know because some of the uh, byproducts are you have either extreme anger about it or extreme embarrassment, extreme fear. All of those deep-seated core emotions that cause us to have a painful reaction, those are areas that are ripe for self-pity to take hold and to deplete you. Gone unchecked, self-pity will rob you of every nutrient of your soul that you can muster to the point where you get to the point where why why am I even here? Or uh, to the point of I can't feel anything. I'm just a zombie walking through the motions. Okay? Or I'm a zombie walking through the motions. Why am I here? And get this. Why should I even try? You know how you see people walking around and you're looking at them and you're like, that person is just giving up. I am not going to say categorically, but I am going to say that one of the culprits that you might want to look at is self-pity. Where is self-pity lingering and latching on like the parasite that it is? So now I know I'm like, oh, this is kind of deep, but trust me. There's silver lining because we're going to start talking a little bit more about some of the ways to start hunting it down in your life, rooting it out and destroying it. Okay. So the first thing is, is because you might be oblivious to it, you have to start recognizing it by some of its symptoms and signs. And then once you recognize it by that, then you get very radical. And we've talked about radical versus surface. Radical is where. It, the cure almost looks as bad as the cause. You get down to the bone, you bore down and you rip out. And if you need to, you press the reset button and you go back to the beginner's mind in that area that needs to be dealt with. You do whatever you need to. Radical means are necessary. Okay. So doing that, what I want you to do is I want you to start looking at, like I said, all of those areas in your mind or or events that happened where you wince and you're like, oh, I can't look at it. I can't bear to deal with it. And look and see if when similar or adjacent thoughts, actions, or situations, because this is a lot of times when self-pity uh, comes out to play. When you are in these times, when you have like those thoughts that come to you or you have a memory or you keep rehearsing a uh, regret or when you find yourself in a situation and instead of you being your quote unquote normal best self where you deal with it, you tend to cower or pull your punches where you clearly shouldn't, that's where Self-pity is living and lurking. And I hate to say this. I wish I could say that self-pity is just in one area of your life. And once you root it out, that's it. No, self-pity is like a cancer. You get one area out and it has sent off a little scout to another area to infect another area. And so sometimes it is like a malignant tumor whack-a-mole. But if you do the work, 
you're going to find so much more benefit for having expended that time. Now, I'm not going to lie and say it's easy. It's not. It's hard. Like anything worth having is hard. There are going to be some sacrifices that you have to make because it's hard, but it's worth it. And it's worth it because self-pity is horrible. It douses all of your previous achievements to the point where you get to self-doubt who you are. I have seen myself do this as well as some of the greats. There are a lot of people that you would be surprised. The reason why they don't continue to perform or to share or to create is not because the talent is not still there, but because self-pity's Self-pity has taken root to the point where it has spawned its cousins. Oh, let's talk about them. Self-pity is notorious for triggering self-doubt, low self-esteem, your immune system, Mm -hmm. weight gain, yes, apathy, Uh uh-huh, depression, anxiety. Should I go on? Because I I hope by now that you are starting to see why you must, and this is priority, you must get to that point. One of the uh, biggest areas that, now this is older data, but one of the biggest areas that was ripe for self-pity to come in and lead to um, destructive behavior was in the area of income, status, and job security. And at the time, and I don't know if these uh, figures still hold true, so that's why I'm prefacing them as an older research. Uh, At the time, they found that it was men, that when men get to the point of self-pity, be careful because this is when they can move into those areas that I talked about of apathy, depression, self-doubt, the whole, why am I even here? And then, not just men, but when you get to this point, you cast a wide net. And because your whole world has turned gray, this is the diabolical part of it. You start to believe that everybody feels this way and that nobody has a reason to live. You'll hear it in different iterations. And this is not an indictment on anyone who has done this. This is by observation. And some, you know, like I said, I gave you a story for some personal reflection and connection to it because I'm not removed from this. And I fight this battle and I want y'all to be vigilant to fight this battle. I mean, when I say I fight it, I've, I've, I've had opportunity to have my wins and I'm really grateful for that. I mean, the very fact that we're having this conversation And me being able to talk about it uh, is a a testament to the work that I do to make sure that mm self-pity, no, no, love don't live here anymore. Nope, you cannot be here with me, okay? So going back to this, uh, how it affects uh, people and the study that that told about how uh, for men, it's the status of what they do what they make, what they build, their uh, livelihoods, how much money they have, how much, uh, where they are um, in their job. And when you take that away from them, self-pity comes in and it gets them to the point where they get into this apathetic depression. And a lot of times when it goes radically wrong, they believe that, why am I here? And if they have family members, it might be my pain is so bad and I'm causing everybody pain. And and why are they here? That then it seems the best logical thing is to put everybody out of their misery. Because why should we live in a world like this? And thus they make headlines when they've attempted or sometimes successfully shot up the place, including themselves. And Yeah, you can be like, oh, Michelle, this is dark. But this is needful because these times are ripe. Self-pity with its lurkiness. And I'm sorry, I just, oh, oh, self-pity. No, no, no. You dirty, low-down bastard. It is riding freely up the streets and the byways and the residential areas and copping squats and getting real comfortable. And so if nothing else that I can do, let this be a service announcement to my dear, wonderful uh, listener family that you don't have to 
allow self-pity to be a living in your place. I have a rule. If you don't help put in on the on the mortgage, you don't get to live here. And I hope that you'll adopt that when you when it comes to the self-pity. So when we are thinking about all of those areas that it can lurk and, and get real snuggled and tight into, you have to get to the point where you treat it as an adversary on the battlefield. You understand that you're going to have many battles with it and you're going to wage war against it. So the first thing is, is to stop being oblivious to it. Like I said, find and root out those areas in your mind, those stories, any places where you have regrets. Look at all of those. And when you touch on those stories, those reflections, those memories, those thoughts, those behaviors, and they cause you to flinch, that's a good area to start doing the work. Now, to do the work is to face it head on. Uh, For some people, it's talking about it, hopefully with a uh, professional therapist who has been trained and with experience of knowing how to handle this. And that is why a lot of people are uh, making their services available online in confidential formats. I encourage you to do with that if you can't, if that's just something you can't do. If you got little ears all over the place, just nosy, listening to everything you do, which is their job because that's how they learn. And if they're stuck in the house with you every day, you're their teacher, whether you want to or not. Then there's another way to do it that I've talked about many times, and that is to journal. Now, with things like this, where there is high embarrassment, there is um, raw emotions, there are things that you do in great regret, and there could possibly be fear around it. So like, say, for instance, you had a wild night, you did some things, you took some things, and now you live in fear. Lest anyone betray your confidence and put it out there, your life is ruined. That's an area where self-pity can really get in. And what you can do is, and it, it, it might sound too simplistic, but it's a start, baby. It's a start. And that is to journal, write it down, dump it. And when you get through, get you a nice, large, fire-resistant, deep pot. Put those pages in there. Light them puppies up and watch them burn down to no to not even smoking. Any pieces that are not burned, you do it again until you truly have ashes. And then don't necessarily throw the ashes away just because you've done that. Wash them with your words and your and your emotions. Thank them for having given you the opportunity and then release them to be able to go into the repository of what you've learned from them, thanking them for the lesson they brought and assuring yourself that you've learned from it. Then you can throw the ashes away. You know, uh, some people, and I know this sounds uh, might sound weird to you, but some people talk about incorporating the ashes with uh, something that will counteract the emotional uh, aftershocks of it. You know, and so there are some people who will take it and mix it with uh, certain types of soil. And then what they'll do is um, they will plant the soil in a certain area and then They'll put compost and all that. Now, I live in a, a HOA that ain't down for that, and I can't do all of that. So, But what I can do is when I have those thoughts, I, I take to my writing, I write it down. Honey, you, you ought to see me <laughs> get in that uh, fire, uh, you know, the one with the long one that you start your fireplace with and lighten those things up until I got complete ashes. Then I take some sage, baby. Oh, yes, I do. I sage the area. I sage myself. I thank you for the lesson. And in my regular journal that I don't just burn up, a lot of times I will write about the lessons, the takeaways, because I want those to endure. And so I memorialize those. But those wincy kind of thoughts like, oh, Lord, mm -mm, you got to burn and you got to go from here. And now and I'll say this, I have, you know, had a few here and there in recent years, uh, well, months, not years. I'm not that old, (laughs) y'all, where, you know, it has nothing to do with the story I told you about. But it's like, oh, why did I do that? Or why did I, you know, accept that or whatever? I did it. 
And because of you guys helping me with these daily podcasts, with expectations and actually listening, wisdom has been doing a work on me. And wisdom has been allowing me to understand and no longer fear the components of chaos. And part of chaos is the destructive fire to bring new birth. And so now when I have a lot of these um, situations that I've told you about, like it might, might, might be a situation where I cowered and I wasn't supposed to. I root out what is the self-pity behind that, driving that? Where's the low self-esteem or where's the compromise happening? I root it out. I write it down. I tear the pages up. Now, I like to tear my little pages up into like equal ones because when I like that tip, I want it all to have an equal opportunity to burn. And then I make sure that all of it is burnt down to a crisp. And I thank chaos for having done her work so that now, The phoenix can rise from the ashes and I can get the new life of a lesson learned promoting me into a better and higher way of living. And I'm going to tell you something to that. (laughs) Don't knock it till you try it. And so those are some of the physical things that you can start to do to root this out. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about this. I want to kind of like twist the butter knife in the wound so it gets so agitated that you get up and you do this today. I want to talk about this, the byproducts of self-pity that make it hard for you to realize that you have it, but very obvious to others. So as I said before, it douses who you used to be, your previous achievements. But not only that, it starts to promote entitlement. You know, self-pity starts to warp your ability to see and your perspective to be able to see different angles to solve your problems to the point where everything is insurmountable. You can only see the obstacles that seem like they cannot be solved by you or anybody else. And this is why you get into the apathy of not being able to do anything where you get stuck. And part of this is because the what we understand of self-pity right now is that it will cause us to have shared trauma. So you have to be careful because you can pass self-pity on to those around you. Beware of those little ones that are in the house with you, learning from you, because they can have learned helplessness as well. Because in everything you do, and that's the thing about this, this, oh, this bastard, it will cause the way you act, your word choices, the way you view things, the way you learn and take in, it will cause you to give up your power by saying, well, um, it's all up to X, Y, or Z. I see a lot of people that don't realize that it is self-pity that causes them to make the political choices they make, that causes them to uh, make the relationship choices, the money choices. It, it, It permeates every area of your life. So let me talk a little bit about codependency because this is where this self-pity really lives and this is where uh, trained professionals have to go to start helping you root this out. So consider this a quick little primer so that you can do some of the work and and get ready, you know, to to root this stuff out radically. So with the codependence, uh, uh, way of understanding, it is where there is, like I said, shared helplessness. And there is a relationship that we call the victim triangle. Um, and the victim triangle involves the victim, the rescuer, and the persecutor. Now, these can be different people, but you can also have all of this happening within your own self. And so, f- case in point, you uh, want to lose weight, you know, got some problems with your weight for health reasons. I'm not talking about vanity here. I'm talking about if you don't lose the weight, something bad happens, right? So you hear this and you're like, I'm going to do it. I am going to do this. And everything in you says, I am doing this. And it might not even be this. It might be the same day that in the morning you were like, I'm going to do this. And at night you find yourself at the drive through getting all manners of foolishness that you know you're not supposed to be having. You eat it. And guess what? You now feel, woe is me. And you feel like, I'm just too weak. I can't do this. Other people are stronger than I am. That's that victim part of the codependence. But then you have the persecutor. 
that comes in and 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 those mental conversations that you have, like you just wing, weak and spineless and look at you, you fat pig or whatever it may be. That's that horrible part that puts you down and um, allows you to say harsh things to yourself that you would never say to other people. And because of that, you, you feel uh, despondent. You feel like, oh my God, I'm just horrible. So then in comes the rescuer. And the rescuer can also be the placator, the peacemaker. It's okay. You got tomorrow. And which is true. But then it goes and it does things like, you know, uh, do this for yourself. And then you can help everyone in your family. And the rescuer starts to uh, do things to get you out of the situation. But the bad part about the rescuer is the rescuer wants some kind of compensation for their efforts. And a lot of times, this is when self-pity comes in and you find yourself saying like, I did all of this and now I, I've destroyed it. You know, you you start beating yourself up because the persecutor loves to go and avenge what the rescuer is uh, do. Let me say this in a different way. A lot of people don't realize that they are rescuers. Uh, Some people have said that they're an enabler. But to say you're an enabler without understanding the whole part of the rescuer is to only give half of it. So, yeah, you might enable and you might rescue. But there is a secondary benefit. You know, there's a kickback that you get. And that is you are tied to that person and you expect that person or that part of you to pay me what you owe me. I did this for you and now I got you. You owe me eternal favors or you owe me eternal loyalty or you owe me money or you owe me to be subjugated to all my crap. I can talk to you any kind of way I want to. and excuse me, parents on down need to realize that this is something that's real. And when you get into this uh, victim triangle, whether it's with you and other people or with you and areas in your life, it is a feeding ground. It is fertilizer for self-pity to come in because in each one of these stages, you'll always get to the point where you regret your actions. You will regret how you were a victim. You will regret the temper tantrum you had during that time. Nobody understands how I have it. You know, this is one of the famous ones for victims. Victims think that you're special because of your inability to do anything, that everybody has it easier than you because maybe they have a job or maybe they have been born into this particular complexion of the race, because we're all one race, by the way, or maybe it's because they knew somebody or somebody did this or luck happened for them or whatever. You're really good at making these excuses. And then when you look at it, there'll be times, little slivers of time when you're like, you need to get up and do stuff. And you don't. And then you beat yourself up for that. Persecution happens. The persecutor comes in harsh, but then you have those regrets. Oh, I was too hard on them. I hate myself. Why am I so mean? Then the rescuer. Oh, I did all of this for them. Why am I, why did I get so upset and hurt? Because they didn't give me back what, what is due me. They didn't give me my props. They didn't love on me. They didn't recognize me in public. They didn't, they, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't. And And so I wish I could tell you that this is real easy. And that's why when I say it's work, I use that word work. Shout out to Byron Katie who talks about the work. And for some people, it'll be a snap of a finger that they get the revelation and they move on. But for others, baby, baby, it's going to take some time. But you need to put in that time because it's important. So when you want to start hunting down and destroying self-pity, not how, not if, when, because self-pity will take you out of here. It will. It will get to the point where it has used you up so much, you have nothing left to give. give and the only thing you need to do is just go somewhere, sit down and die. Mm-hmm. It will put on you uh, diseases. It will put on you weight gain because I'm going to tell you, Feeling heavy makes you heavy and self-pity is very heavy. And I should have said that as well as one of the indicators that you got some self-pity. If you feel heavy, if it's hard to move, and when I say move, if it's hard to get motivated, that's probably a tip off point that you've got some self-pity, some woe is me happening in there, where if you really get honest and objective, you can see that you've got this long list of why you can't do stuff and 
not even realizing that you're playing the victim. And self-pity is having a field day. I mean, self-pity looks like uh, Bacchus just laying out drunk in wine, full of itself, because it is feeding off the good, good that you give it. All the vitality of who you can be or could be is being siphoned off to feed this diabolical um, state of self-pity. So in my last few moments that I have with you, because my time is really going down, let's let's just let's just recap this. OK, so self-pity, self-pity is that part of you that is connected to the victim. The why is this happening to me? The woe is me. Self-pity is uh, it loves to live in the shadows. It does not like to be seen or recognized by the person it's infecting. A lot of times it is not a lot of times. It is found in that codependency uh, loop that we find ourselves in. And be careful to say, don't don't say that you're not in codependence because codependence is actually part of Western society's social makeup of how we view community. Quid pro quo. You do something for me, I expect you to do something for you. You know, uh, I'm expected to do something for you. So understand that that's at play. So get rid of self-pity. Uh, by doing the work, using your journaling, talking to a therapist, uh, arresting thoughts that come in and viscerally make you wince or react to them. Deal with them then. Don't let them pile up and get compacted in the back of your mind where self-pity can set up camp and uh, uh, live there forever. And make sure that you recognize its triggers of low self-esteem. It's like those background apps of poisonous thinking continuously running in the background and recoding your mind in your life. And if all at all possible, make sure that you do not fall into the victim trap and that you don't become blinded to the things that uh, would cause you to think less of yourself and in turn behave in a lesser way. So y'all, my time is up. I thank you for yours. This has been Michelle Spivey, your Practical Priestess of Whistle with another podcast of Whistle Smack. And that's going to do it for today's podcast of Wisdom Smack with Michelle Spiva. If you like this podcast, please help us get the word out. Like, comment, subscribe, and even share. And if you really like it, please help us continue to get the word out by considering using this show's link for Amazon. So when you want to go to Amazon and you do all of your general shopping, Uh, please use michellespiva.com forward slash AMZ. It's simple as that. It doesn't cost you anything extra. And this show might receive a little bit of commission that will go towards helping to further get these episodes out to you and to others. So thank you so much for listening. This has been Michelle Spiva with Wisdom Smack. Bye.